Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. The Bonobo Way with Dr. Susan Block. Susan Marilyn Block, PhD, is founder and director of the Dr. Susan Block Institute for the Erotic Arts and Sciences. A world-renowned sexologist and best-selling author, her book, The Bonobo Way, The Evolution of Peace Through Pleasure, has garnered critical acclaim from a variety of media outlets and celebrities, from politicians to porn stars. A magna cum laude graduate of Yale University with distinction in theater studies, Dr. Block, a.k.a. Dr. Susie, received her master's and doctorate degree in psychology from California Miramar University and an honorary doctorate from the Institute for the Advanced Study of Human Sexuality. In our conversation, we started out with the basics of bonobo life and then moved on to the effects of geography on their evolution, how sex makes you smarter, the bonobo handshake, how male bonobos are mama's boys, releasing your inner bonobo, sexual puritanism on the left, how humans were more egalitarian and sexually adventurous as gatherer hunters than we are today, and the efforts to save bonobos and their habitat in the wild. If you like this episode, please share it on social media and subscribe to the podcast so that you don't miss future episodes. To support this work financially, you can make a one-time donation to username Colibri at paypal.me or at Venmo. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. You can also become a member at patreon.com slash Colibri, and you'll get early access to new episodes, exclusive digital content, and goodies mailed to you. Now here is my interview with Dr. Susan Block. Dr. Susan Block, it's really a pleasure that you're spending some time talking to me today. Thank you so much. It is a pleasure for me to be here with you. Today, we wanted to talk about your favorite topic, the bonobo way. Yes. And I uh, got the Kindle version of your book a few days ago, and I didn't read the whole thing, but I got through a lot of it. And um, I'm fascinated by bonobos. I think that anyone who's ever heard even the smallest thing about bonobos is fascinated by them. But I also think there's a lot of people who don't know about them at all, maybe not even anything. So I'd really like to start off uh, talking about just the very basics of bonobos with you. Yes. Well, yeah. Okay. That sounds good. Bonobo basics. Mm -hmm. So number one, bonobos are very close to us. They are over 98% genetically similar to human, like common chimps. Bonobos are a kind of chimp, and we're all a kind of ape. We're all apes. We're sometimes called the naked ape because we're not quite as hairy as uh, the bonobos and the common chimps and the gorillas. Well, most of us humans aren't, but some of us maybe especially... (laughs) in the corona apocalypse are even hairier. But anyway, uh, bonobos are very close to us. They are the closest other non-human animal to us besides common chimps. Uh, Gorillas are a little farther away and orangutans a little farther, Uh, but uh, we're all part of the great ape uh, species, or we're not species, but uh, I guess category, family. Right. Uh, we're Homo sapiens, they're pan paniscus, uh, and common chimps are pan troglodyte. And uh, so they're very, very close. Um, and number two, a thing to know about bonobos, besides how close they are to us, is me being a sexologist, I put this at number two, they have a lot of sex, right? Right. In a bonobo sutra of positions, every position, you know, a lot of people think that 
humans are the only animals to have sex face to face. Well, that's not true. Bonobos have sex face to face. In fact, they kind of prefer sex face to face, both because of the way that their genitalia is placed and also because it's kind of more intimate. And bonobos are into intimacy. They they have a lot of sex, uh, both quantity and quality. And by quality, I do mean intimacy. Uh, they really express all the forms of love from agape to eros. Uh, they're very lusty, uh, bonobos are, and very loving. And uh, they also have sex in a lot of quantity. They're You might call them polyamorous, although maybe um, pansexual would be a better word since uh, their Latin classification is pan paniscus. And they're kind of ruled by the great Greek god Pan, the the lord of the wild, the animals, the non-human animals, that is, because we are animals, too. Something that we often forget. And that I think is good to remember that we're animals too. So bonobos are very sexual, just like us. And, uh, and that's number two. So number three, I think that's important to know about bonobos is that they are very female empowered. Uh, you could say females rule bonoboville. And not just the young and the fertile, but uh, you could say MILFs rule Bonoboville. By that, I mean <laughs> the older females. Uh, it's, it's not exactly a matriarchy in the way that common chimps are a patriarchy. Common chimps, you know, the males rule by brutality, really. Uh, they kind of police each other and the females. And there's a lot of rape and there's a lot of beating up and there's a lot of a fair amount of murder, I guess, nowhere near as much as there is murder among humans, but there's a certain amount of murder and even what we might call war among common ships. But no, there's there's no murder among bonobos. We'll get to that in a minute. But bonobo females do kind of rule bonoboville, I say kind of, because they share it with bonobo males, because they are more sharing oriented, I guess, than common chimps. And uh, they they share resources, they share food, they share sex. But yeah, the females are the ones that get first dibs on the food and the sex and the resources, and then they share it. So number four, I think it's important to note that the males are happy. Right. (laughs) Because after all, you got all these females queening around here. You would think the males would be upset. At least a lot of uh, Republican males would say, well, what about the guys? And uh, and so I would say, yeah, the guys give up some of their power, but they get in exchange. Well, a lot of sex. (laughs) And that's why they are okay with that. But they get more than that. They get care they get um they get an easier life than the common chimp guys because the common chimp guys are always afraid for their lives whether they're um, the alpha male or certainly if they're lower on the totem pole uh they can get beaten killed it's a very tough life being a common chimp male even tougher to be a common chimp female uh who get raped a lot uh but uh bonobo males Uh, They live kind of a nice life, you know, and they seem to sip from a kind of bonobo fountain of youth in a way. Uh, You know, they they definitely uh, stay younger, longer than their common chimp counterparts who are cute as kids, but then grow up very quickly into grouchy old apes because of all the pressure. Pressure is the enemy of pleasure. And there's a lot less pressure in Bonoboville with the females in charge and the males are kind of treated like little princes. I, I don't know. They're, they're happier. So then we come to uh, number five of the five points that I think are most important to, to note about bonobos. Um, and that is that bonobos make peace through pleasure. 
all of these characteristics I've just been describing, how close they are to us, as well as how much sex they have. And by sex, I mean, yes, the old in and out, but also what we might call foreplay and what I often call outer course, uh, affection, um, touching, hugging, uh, massaging, licking, um, caring. And so number two, the females rule, but share their rule with the males. The males are happy as number four. And number five, this creates a kind of peace through pleasure. Um, Bonobos have never been seen killing each other in the wild or captivity. This is extremely unusual among great apes. The common chimps do kill each other. The gorillas, not so much. But yeah, I mean, if a uh, alpha gorilla dies and then these other gorilla males will come in and take charge of his harem, they will kill the babies. So there's quite a bit of infanticide among gorillas, unfortunately. Um, orangutans also have been known to kill each other, unfortunately. But bonobos, no, uh, so far at least. And I hope that before some crazy humans uh, put a gun in the hands of bonobos and teach them how to shoot it, and they're very clever, so they could probably learn it, I hope they teach us how to make peace through pleasure first. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. They're very inspiring. Uh, it's, it's so inspiring to know that these animals who, to whom we are so closely related have these really idyllic, you know, lives, you know, that uh, uh, both individually and, and communally, it just seems like a kind of uh, a kind of a paradise. You, you, you compared it a little bit to the, uh, the garden of earthly delights uh, in your yeah. book. And I thought that was a good one. I, I used to have a, a print of that hanging up uh, just because it was so fascinating. And of course, you know, the painting, well, I'm sure to, to, to look at all the different uh, fun activities going on, you know, in, in, in that painting. And then to hear vivid descriptions that you, you give in the beginning of the book there about all the different ways that the bonobos are interacting with each other sexually. It was just like, wow, you know, this is, this is really, it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's inspiring, you know, obviously. They are the make love, not war chimpanzees who swing through the trees as well as with each other. Right. Right. And, and I think that, you know, some people might ask why it is that the bonobos are different than all these other apes. And uh, what you mentioned in the book is that uh, it seems to be at least partly because of geography and how the animals that would become bonobos were separated from the other apes, uh, I, I believe a couple million years ago by mm -hmm. the Congo River, and that conditions on that side of the river are very different than conditions on the other side of the river. Yes, conditions have a lot to do with why bonobos are the way they are and why there's hope for humanity. You know, it's not all about genetics, although we do have a close enough genetics that we could be like bonobos. And bonobos apparently were separated from their common ancestor or of common chimps uh, about 2 million years ago when common chimps went off from the, um, the rainforest in the Congo where bonobos still are. And they kind of migrated into uh, less hospitable terrain, you could say, and, uh, and, and therefore developed a more aggressive personality. Um, and, uh, and that's one pretty plausible theory about why common chimps who are so close genetically to bonobos are so different behaviorally from bonobos because they were in more difficult territory. Uh, we could say that maybe that's one reason humans have been the way we've been because we've uh, gone through some pretty difficult territory. But at this moment, you know, there's enough on earth to feed everyone. It's just that our society's out of whack in terms of how we share. 
Uh, but we could be in as abundant a place as the rainforest has been for bonobos. And by the way, I do want to say that although bonobos have been in a kind of paradise in the rainforest, uh, and the rainforest um, is a kind of paradise, unfortunately, it's, um, it's changing and not for the better, uh, both uh, in terms of the rainforest itself. It's uh, one of the great lungs of the earth. Uh, the other one being the Amazon, and uh, it's like these lungs have got COVID-19. Uh, they're, they're not doing too well with all the mining and uh, the other forms of pollution that humans are doing. Plus, of course, humans are desperate and hungry in that area and often uh, killing bonobos, poaching them in the wild, which is why I'm my big cause is to save the bonobos from extinction. Uh, and uh, we can talk more about that later, but uh, they do have an idyllic life and uh, hopefully humans won't ruin it. Right, right. One thing that you also noted in the book was how incredibly intelligent the bonobos are. You talked about how they were able to learn to speak with humans in different ways. I think some of it was through, um, so it wasn't all through sound, some of it was through technology. Yeah, some through sign language, some through computers. Mm -hmm. Right. And then you also made the point in there that sex makes you smarter. <laughs> yes, yes. That's, uh, that's been proven in a few studies that people that have more sex tend to have higher IQs and, uh, and that sort of thing. Right. And so I don't know, it's funny, because of course, some people might hear about all the fun that bonobos are having and, and trying to find a way of being sprawl sports about it might be like, oh, well, whatever. But you know, then when you find out that, well, they're also very intelligent, and that maybe the sex is helping them to make them more intelligent. Well, you know. <laughs> yeah, I think the sex is helping make them more intelligent. And I think the sex also really helps them. And this is how they're different from common chimps one way is that it helps them make them more cooperative. And when given tasks to do individually, they tend to perform similarly to common chimps, but whenever given tasks to do uh, with others, with other bonobos, bonobos usually outperform common chimps because they're more likely to cooperate. They like to share. Right. They find sharing to be um, a benefit to them as individuals. Yeah, and I guess that really, like all of their relations are entirely different than, than or, or so different than all these other apes and, and including, unfortunately, most of us humans. And one thing you mentioned that I thought was fascinating was the bonobo handshake. Yes, a bonobo handshake, which is the name of a book by a colleague and friend of mine, a guest on my show, Vanessa Woods. And uh, the bonobo handshake is basically a uh, kind of a code word for the way that bonobos often greet each other, which is to kind of feel up each other's genitals and say hi, you know, and sometimes they do this to humans too, which is kind of interesting for the humans. Uh, they're very friendly. They just like we give a handshake, so do they. And the bonobo handshake is hand to genitals. And something interesting uh, that I've learned in my past Bible studies when I used to read the Bible uh, is that in the Bible, uh, yeah, there is a kind of a bonobo handshake because way back in Bible times, um, this was uh, before the Old Testament was written, um, men used to swear an oath by putting their hands on each other's testicles. And that's why the word testament and testicles come from the same root, which is testes, which is I swear on your family jewels that I'm going to do this thing you want me to do or else, you know, my family will go after your family. But they would hold each other by the nuts. And uh, you, you hear it in the Bible in passages where they talk about he put his hand on his thigh. Well, thigh, you know, it, that, that was a euphemism uh, by King James, probably, <laughs> for the nuts, for, for the family jewels, because the bonobo handshake 
is probably something that is in the ancient prehistory of humans too. I was especially tickled by that particular story in the book. I was raised Catholic, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I went to a Catholic grade school and Catholic high school. And, you know, just to sort of think about the shock that some of my my teachers, including the priest would have had when um, presented with this idea was really entertaining to me personally. (laughs) Yes, yes. But maybe you remember when the, the Bible would say he put his hand on his thigh and as a kid, you were probably like me and wondering, why is he putting his hand on his thigh? Yeah, that part did ring a bell, actually, because I, <laughs> I, yeah, and I ended up doing biblical study stuff in college, too. And and so I've, I've read not the whole thing, but most of it. And yeah, that rang a bell. And to find out, oh, testify, testicles. Wow, that's great. Yeah. And I love, I love etymology, too. So that was fabulous. So we think a bonobo handshake is so wild and so crazy. But yeah, it's in our genes, too. And I'm not just talking about our pants, but <laughs> in our history. Right, right. And and then another way in which our history might be similar to the bonobos is, we've already alluded to the fact that they have a lot of sex, but to get into that one a little bit more, the way that they're having sexual interactions with each other is not private. It's often public. And although it can be one-on-one, it is not always one-on-one and is very orgy-like. Yes, um, Giuliani's daughter, uh, Caroline, would be at home among bonobos. I just heard she's polyamorous and pansexual, Mm -hmm. so good for her. Uh, Anyway, yes, they are extremely orgiastic. Uh, They mix and match. I mean, they get great favorites, just like we get best friends, and sometimes they'll go off and be together, two of them, for a couple weeks or something. But usually they mix and match within the community and they, uh, they all have sex interchangeably. Um, it's not like they have sex with anybody, but they could have sex with anybody, if that makes sense. Right. And they are all pretty much, I guess, for want of a better word, bisexual. Uh, the females have a lot of sex together uh, and it's very, very intense, very orgasmic. In fact, some primatologists say it's more orgasmic than male female sex. I don't know, but they certainly rub, 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 rub each other's genitalia, vulvas against each other, gigantic protruding clitorises, just exploding in pleasures, sometimes to the point where they fall out of their trees because they do this a lot in trees, <laughs> but they know how to land. They're kind of like cats that way. So it's okay. Um, and so the females do it uh, in a, in a, it's, it's a, it's sensual, it's physical, but it's also very political and social. And uh, you know, if, if you are having sex with a high ranking female, you're very special and you're probably going to scream louder so everybody can hear you. Mm. Uh, And the vocalizations of bonobos are very interesting. It reminds us of why we often uh, scream when we're having sex. It's not just because we're having a good time. It's kind of because we want other people to know, Mm. even though we may not. We may think we don't, but something deep within our background, our uh, prehistory does want the community to know we're having sex. Yay. We're in good shape. We're doing good. You know, Uh, we're a good sex partner. You might want to have sex with us too. That's what that vocalization is. And that's one reason the bonobo females are known to do that. And uh, yes, it's, it's very political. Um, Bonobo males also have sex together and it's also very political and it's also very sensual and it's, Um, You know, they have conflicts sometimes, uh, obviously, over various things. Bonobos are not angels. They're animals like we are. And they fight just like we do. It's just they don't kill each other or naturally bomb each other. They (laughs) they find ways to resolve the fighting and biting. Sometimes they bite just like humans sometimes bite. 
but uh, they resolve it with some form of sex, with some form of exchange of pleasure, maybe some food, um, you know, resources. Sex is a resource. Sex is something I'm giving you as a present, as a gift. And so when bonobos are struggling like this over some conflict, uh, the males might do what they call penis fencing. Uh, and this is actually done among lots of non-human animals where they rub their penises together. By the way, it is also done among some human <laughs> animals. Um, and a lot of guys really enjoy that, uh, rubbing their penises together. Uh, and it is a little bit of a competitive thing, but yet friendly. It's like, I'm rubbing against you. I'm not hurting you. Whose is bigger? Maybe mine, maybe yours. Whose is stronger? Let's see. But everybody's going to have a good time here. And basically, that's what happens. And then they have some rump rubbing is what they call it. Uh, and, um, you know, basically, you've got a whole repertoire of fun activities so that uh, there are no incels in Bonoboville. Right. That's really wonderful to hear. And to keep on the subject of the, the male bonobos for a moment, you talked about their socialization and said that they could be likened to mama's boys. Yes, yes. Well, you know, even though there's a lot of sharing among bonobos, and sometimes I call a bonobo tribe Bonoboville, I actually call my own group of people who are what I call bonobo sapiens. We call ourselves Bonoboville, and we have a a site called Bonoboville. But in any case, uh, in Bonoboville, um, the males are, uh, are, you know, more or less equal, at least more equal than among common chimps. But there is a hierarchy. And the hierarchy is determined by your mom. So the alpha female, her son is going to probably be the alpha male. Uh, and that's generally how it goes. And the whereas the females migrate among bonobos as well as among common chimps, the females are the ones that leave the nest and go to a new tribe in order to you know make their way in adulthood. So the males stay home. They stay with their mom, probably their whole life, uh, at least until one of them dies. They are with their mom and their mom, maybe she makes sure they're good boys. I don't know. She seems to, they have a great relationship and the mom and son are the only pairing that don't have actual, uh, I guess you would say sexual intercourse. They don't have sexual intercourse. They might be licking and playing and hugging a lot but not uh, sexual intercourse. The fathers and daughters don't either, but that's not because there's any kind of taboo for it. It's because the daughters migrate. So that's how they handle that. But uh, yeah, the daughters migrate, the sons stay with their mom, and then mom basically makes sure the son is uh, you know, respected because the mom is in charge. And also she will introduce her son to her friends and then he'll get sex partners that way because her friends are her, her own age. And then he gets to learn how to have sex from hot milfs or they're the new younger bonobo females that come in from the other tribes and that kind of suck up to the females, so to speak, in the uh, it, in in the, the tribe we're talking about, and that way they gain more status and have sex with the males that they're introduced to in that tribe. Hopefully that all made sense. Oh, yeah, definitely. It, it's amazing, too. It, it's also so interesting, too, just this idea of the mother introducing the son to the son's sexual partners. Yes, it's, um, it is very interesting. And when I talk about it to a lot of guys, they go, wow, I wish my mom would do that. Uh, but in any case, it's, uh, it's, 
it's, you know, we have so many issues with our parents and our crazed nuclear family poison society. <laughs> but uh, I who's to say that that is not a better way of, uh, of living? Certainly, the, the degree that um, men that I talk to as a sex therapist uh, have mother issues, I would say the way we've been doing it isn't that great. So, um, yeah, the bonobos, uh, this is their way of dealing with uh, the mother-son relationship. Right. I'm glad you brought it, brought it around to humans there because obviously we can look at this, we can look at the relation, the, the close relation, and then we can look at ourselves and we can be like, okay, wait a minute, H- how is it that they can be examples you know, for us? Well, I look at them that way. I don't look at bonobos as a blueprint. I don't want to live in trees. You know, I don't do a lot of things that the bonobos do. And they do have sex across generations. It's true. Uh, you know, it's it's not like we should copy everything about them. And there have been movies made and strange things written about people that try to live exactly like bonobos. I don't do that. I do try to uh, think what would bonobos do in certain difficult situations. I am inspired by them. I try to live a life of openness. I myself am married for over 28 years. Bonobos don't get married, so I'm not all that bonobo. But I always honor my fantasy life. And I think it's important for uh, humans to... Uh, acknowledge that uh, deep in our genes, we are probably all pansexual. And that may not be the best way to, um, to live your life. But it is, I think, a good idea to acknowledge that that's kind of how we're wired. And uh, it, it's, it's, um, it helps. It helps to be understanding about our partners our feelings, um, what love and lust mean, uh, and the bonobos help us with that. Bonobos also certainly inspire me in terms of female empowerment. I mean, for so many years when I was a student, I, I thought I wanted to be an anthropology major because I like this stuff. But then I decided, nah, it's all about guys. I don't want to do that. It's all about guys being violent and how, you know, the killer ape, the rules and uh, everything's all about how humans are descended from the killer ape. And I, I'm not that into that. So I majored in theater, which <laughs> enables me to make up stories. But then I learned that the real story didn't have to be made up. The real story includes bonobos. And they didn't teach that when I was a kid. And uh, now they are. And it's really amazing to be able to see that there is this other great ape, because I do consider humans to be apes, uh, that is very close to us, equally close as common chimps. Some primatologists say closer, uh, but that they have females running things and that it's great for the males. I mean, for so long, we've heard that feminism is an aberration. It's unnatural. It might be good. It might be what we want, but it's unnatural. Well, it is natural. And the bonobos show us just how natural it is. So shut your mouth when you say it's unnatural for the females to be in charge, as well as when you say that the males uh, won't like it. Because comment, because Bonobo males, they are bigger and stronger than the females, just like common chimps and just like humans. And they have fangs. The females don't have fangs. So if a bonobo male wanted to overpower a female, he could do that easily. The thing is, they don't because they don't want to. They For various reasons. One is, as I said, they're getting laid. They like their life. Two is the females don't hang out alone. And I know it's kind of like you don't want to say that human females shouldn't be able to hang out alone. Of course, we should. And that's another way in which I'm 
not saying we should be just like bonobos, but there is a certain wisdom in solidarity and there is a female solidarity among bonobos. And so if a male is so ignorant or insolent as to go after a female or her baby, she will call out and her girlfriends will come running to help her. And that is basically why the bonobo males don't get out of line. They don't want to, because one bonobo male could overpower one female, but when two or three gang up on him, he's in trouble. And they do sometimes do that. And they will beat up a bonobo male if he does get out of line, but they don't kill him so far. So that's something. Right, right. So, I mean, really, just the very existence of uh, bonobos means that we have far less of an excuse for our own bad behavior, really. Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that is what all of these uh, patriarchal, environment destroying, warmongering, uh, you know, lords over the world have been trying to say is that we're killer apes and that that's the law of the jungle. Well, bonobos are in the jungle. And in fact, in the rainforest, they're the biggest animals in the jungle. They are the lords and ladies of the jungle. And hey, the ladies are pretty much in charge. So they're yeah, no, it's it's great. It's really, it's definitely inspiring. So one phrase that you also use in the book, you say, release your inner bonobo. Yeah, well, I think uh, we all have an inner bonobo. You know, we all like to have fun. It's like an inner child, but it's not childish, maybe childlike. Bonobos are what they call neotenous. They're very childlike. Uh, they keep their neotenous look, their, their youthful look. And that's one of the reasons that they like each other so much because they're so youthful and we all like youth and they like each other for being youthful. And, uh, and yeah, they're, um, they're, we have that inside of us. And I think, um, you know, uh, I mean, we, our whole society needs a desperate overhaul a revolution, if you will, but the revolution starts with me and with you and with every person, you know? Uh, so uh, yeah, release your inner bonobo, be more uh, in touch with your animal nature. I think it's good to release any uh, animal nature we might have. Some people identify with wolves or uh, pussy cats or, horny dogs or whatever animal, you know, it's, it's good to get out of your idea that the humans are, you know, that dominion different kind of species than all the other species. We're not that different. Uh, we've caused a lot of trouble, but we, we have a lot of the same feelings as so many other creatures of this earth. And, uh, so yeah, I mean, release your inner, uh, Tweety Bird or, uh, you know, it's the year of the ox. But bonobos are really close to us. And I guess I have a boner for bonobos in particular. So, yeah, I think it's it's fun to release your inner bonobo, uh, to be more sexual uh, in a positive way, in a consensual way. A lot of talk now about what is good sex. You know, the Me Too movement has brought to our attention that uh, there are a lot of people, mostly of the male gender, but not totally, that, uh, you know, don't understand boundaries and uh, need to learn these boundaries or don't want to understand. And, uh, and, and certainly bonobo females can teach uh, the Me Too movement a lot about how to stand up for our sisters, how to stop rape. Rape is very rare in Bonoboville. But bonobos also uh, teach us that male well-being is important. And sometimes I kind of think that my sisters in the Me Too movement maybe don't get that 
uh, I don't know, it's hard to get. And especially when so many males are, you know, patriarchal and incels, and I don't know, uh, you know, warmongering. But uh, at the same time, male sexuality is incredibly important and delicate and, uh, and, and beautiful. And the bonobos remind us of that. And the way that the bonobos honor the males uh, is especially important. And the way that they uh, are almost guaranteed some form of sexual release, uh, whether from the older MILFs or the females, the younger ones that come in uh, from other tribes or from each other, because of course, Male male sex is very accepted, unlike in human society where it is still uh, subject to um, to denigration. If um, male male sex wasn't so denigrated, I think males would be a lot happier. As a sex therapist, I talk to so many men who are eroticized in some way by other men, whether they actually want to have sex with the other men, or they just uh, fantasize about gang bangs, you know, where there's a bunch of guys and some hot female, or they fantasize about cuckolding. Cuckolding is very, very big, especially among Republican men, interestingly. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's like uh, a, a little bit twisted, but in a way, it's a beautiful thing to uh, just say, hey, uh, the woman that I'm with, I can share her with other men. Uh, it is a little bit of a patriarchal construct, but I'm all for the concept of sharing. Um, so, yeah, these are all different ways in which you might release your inner bonobo um, in a consensual uh, and hopefully safe uh, way. It's it's not so easy in the corona apocalypse, of course, with um, not being able to touch, uh, except with people that you're sheltering in place with. So um, not a great time to um, to <clears throat> express your polyamorous pansexual desires. But certainly the 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 maybe the the crown of uh, bonobo achievement and the way that I hope people really release their inner bonobos um, in a global way is through peace, through pleasure. And uh, yeah, we, we really do need to, uh, to learn to, uh, to take our violent tendencies and channel them into um, the bonobo way into uh, into sharing, into caring, into sex, into lust and not greed. Um, that's another way in which the bonobos inspire me, uh, that um, they're very lusty, but they're not greedy. And I do think that that's how humans are in our most basic way. I, I think we've changed a lot I, but I think it's all socialization I don't I don't think it's in our uh, our nature I, I think that uh, like bonobos we're lusty and not all that greedy uh, it's mainly our corrupt leaders and and these deranged billionaires who convince us that lust is bad and that greed is good. I mean, lust has its drawbacks, you know, uh, especially in a pandemic, but greed is always bad for everybody, even the greedy person. And uh, bonobos don't tolerate that. Just like I believe that our original hunter-gatherer ancestors who were probably very polyamorous and pansexual, I don't think they tolerated greed either. Then we started farming and things got different, you know, bonobos don't farm. <laughs> right. Uh, so, you know, there's where the big difference uh, comes down is once you have a farm, you have property and then you own that property and then you start wanting uh, to, you know, protect that property and that property becomes something that you will die over or 
better yet, have other people die over. And uh, then you want to own your wife and you want to own your kids so you can pass down your farm to somebody and see how greed develops. But I don't think it's part of our animal nature. Our animal nature is to be lusty and peaceful, peace through pleasure. Got to have the pleasure. See, I think that a lot of the my fellow lefties, um, <laughs> you know, they're all for the peace, but they kind of look down on the pleasure and no wonder they don't get more votes, you know? I feel like I find that to be the case too. I mean, I was born in 1969, so I was a teenager in the 80s, and that was kind of a, a, a terrible time to be coming in, into puberty and all this because AIDS, of course, was happening at that point. And so, you know, sex was starting to feel a little more restrained than it had been for people, you know, previous to that. And I remember that at that time, and I was growing up in Omaha, Nebraska, right? So conservative, wow. red state place, Catholic schools, and the two things that I remember most vividly from my teenage years that sort of broke through that wall and were inspiring in some way. And that were all about pleasure were first of all, Prince and his music, you know, yeah. and as a young man who definitely, I was having all sorts of homosexual urges and a few heterosexual ones. And then was, you know, not comfortable with the male role models that was around me. Prince was just amazing, of course, because he's so androgynous and so incredibly sex positive, you know, yeah. and you listen to his lyrics and like, it seemed to be suggesting that he was hooking up with boys too. And that that was great. You know what I mean? And, and then, and then the other influence was the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> right? Because that would show at midnight at one of the local theaters. And so some of us would go, you know, and go see that like on the weekends, you know. Let's and, do the time warp again. Exactly. You know, the sweet transvestite from transsexual, you know, and, and how Dr. Frankenfurter has sex first with the wife and then with the husband and they're treated exactly the same, you know. And yeah. And, yeah. And so I had that, I had that instilled in me at that impressionable, you know, age, you know what I mean? And, yeah. and, and really felt like the whole thing about, you know, free love and let's get away from all this limitation that's always been in me, but I haven't found, you know, outside of like the gay community or something like that, you know, I haven't really found that in lefty culture at large so much. It, it seems like there's a lot of sexual uptightness in the left. Yeah, there's a lot of Puritans mm -hmm. on the left. It's amazing, you know, because sex is the greatest stimulation for revolution, you know. But uh, I liked Che Guevara when I was a kid because he was sexy. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I, I didn't know anything about what he stood for. You know, that's what inspires the youth is something sexy. And Prince, yes, he was sexy, Prince and the revolution, but right. he meant something more than sex. He was all about sex, but he was also about a real revolution and about peace and about understanding and about accepting our sexuality and, um, and each other. And he was very androgynous. He was beautiful. And yeah, yeah. So you got to release your inner bonobo, even in Nebraska, amongst the Catholics. I got, I got to feel my inner bonobo. I didn't get to release it or experience it I nearly as much as I wanted to. Times, oh, oh certainly. But not, you know, not, not as much as I wanted to, you know. Not so. as much as you wanted to. And it's, yeah. it's all relative. You know, we we none of us... In this society, we're in a capitalist, grinding, uh, dying uh, humanity here. It's it's hard to be able to release your inner bonobo in any kind of, you know, ongoing way. So to be able to do it in in temporary ways is a gift, is a blessing, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. we have to build on that uh, to uh, to give ourselves strength to handle all the craziness going on in this world. Right, right. And another way in which there's kind of a contrast there to overcome is that, you know, we talk about how part of the reason the bonobos have this great easygoing culture is because they're living in a place of abundance, right? And we live in a culture that is really based a lot on scarcity or the idea of scarcity 
even if it's just a manufactured scarcity, right? So, I mean, that goes back to the agricultural revolution of the storing of grains. And so that some, yeah. you know, it could be held back from other people, you know, and, you know, in our culture too, I think the the scarcity thing happens around sex too. And so I think that leads to all kinds of, um, well, obviously, you know this because you're a sexologist and, and a therapist, it leads to all sorts of different, you know, problems for people. Major problems, definitely one of which is the incel problem. Right. And I mean, people talk a lot about who was at that uh, Capitol riot. I call it the rape of the Capitol because it was so exuberant and like this horrible gang rape. Uh, and I think there were a lot of incels in there. Um, I, I just think that so much sexuality is denigrated by our culture and limited and the whole idea that you know the only way you can express your sexuality respectably is to get married and uh and then have sex for having lots of children and uh, maybe you can have a little sex to keep the marriage going but don't be too crazy about it and uh, certainly uh, gay sex okay well i guess it's okay but then you guys got to get married too just like, um, you know, heterosexual people, so you can share that type of misery, um, you know, and it, there's just such a, <clears throat> a dearth of, uh, of, of sexual possibility out there. And, and now, of course, on the left, uh, I think there's, you know, a, a lot of people are so suspicious of everybody uh, in terms of, your sexuality and 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 maybe you might be aggressive. Are you going to be too flirtatious? Um, and uh, you know, I I'm on the fence about this. It's a complex thing. I I certainly believe that enthusiastic consent is very important, but I also believe that uh, that sex is very important and that flirtation and teasing and uh, and and sex should be a part of all of our lives. And it should be in the air. It's that's how it is among bonobos. And that's why they make peace through pleasure. That's uh, what lubricates life in Bonoboville is sexuality. So I think it would be good for us to do that, too. I also think um, that some of our greatest uh, sex educators in this world that is so puritanical and sex phobic are sex workers, you know, and uh, it's sad for me to see the, um, the wonderful profession of sex work, which is the oldest profession uh, and, uh, and at its finest, it might be called courtesans. And now it's being mixed up with trafficking. Okay. I don't think anybody, certainly nobody in the sex work field that is a real sex worker approves of trafficking, of any kind of trafficking, whether it's trafficking of humans for sex or to work at McDonald's. People should not be forced into any kind of slavery, okay? Uh, and yeah, it happens at all different levels of life and work in this crazy capitalist society. Uh, but right now with laws like SESTA and FOSTA, we have conflated um, sex work with, uh, with trafficking and it has harmed sex workers, real sex workers, whether they're women or men or trans people or gender fluid people. All kinds of people are in the sex work trade because, hey, when you're in the sex work trade, you start, you know, you're more accepted. It, it's like in sexuality, people are looking for all these different categories because it's fun. Um, and so, yeah, so a lot of trans people find where they're not accepted in other jobs, they can make a living in sex work, but it's just um, you know, so difficult now. Uh, so many publications have been shut down. Hey, I believe in cancel culture, actually, but I don't believe in censorship from the top down. And that is what is going on against sex workers, censorship on all the social media, 
uh, closing down of back page that was done a few years ago. Uh, these things harm sex workers and eventually it harms all of us because it restricts our ability to express ourselves sexually. Plus all those people that would normally be cooled out by seeing sex workers can't find them now. They're like, where are the sex workers? I, I used to be able to find them on the internet. Can't, can't do it now. Uh, so it's, uh, it's important. And in terms of bonobos, yes, bonobos practice sex work. And actually, sex work is something that's done all through the animal world. Um, and it's basically called sex for meat. Um, one animal provides sex and the other animal provides food. Um, whether or not they all have a good time, I don't know. But, but there's this exchange of goods for sex. And that is beyond capitalism. That, that's so basic to, to nature. It's, it's even beyond mammals. Insects do this. Um, but the interesting thing about bonobos is that it's often the girls that pick up the check. See? Mm. Among uh, most other animals, um, it's the male of the species that provides the food and the female that provides the sex. And that is kind of prevalent in, in most of uh, the animal world. But among bonobos, it is often the females who provide the food in exchange for sex with the partner of their choice or perhaps a certain type of sex that they want to have. Like, I'll give you a banana if you suck my toes, you know. Um, why is it this way? Because the females have the bananas. So, you know, because the females get that first dibs on food, that means that they also are often the so-called Johns <laughs> in uh, the world of sex work among bonobos. Right, right, and, and that's really pretty interesting because in the in human culture uh, prior to agriculture, when we were foraging, when we were gathering and hunting, we think of the cavemen as being hunters and they were just eating meat all the time. But but actually, you know, when we look at the evidence, it, it appears as though the gathering component of it that was done by the women primarily was a much bigger part of the diet. Was certainly a uh, more reliable part of the diet. And in some uh, cultures was comprising 80% of the diet. And that this was why the pre-agricultural societies were so much more egalitarian. Yes, because the females got some goods. They got, they got some of the food. They provided, I guess, what I've heard is about half the calories. The right. males might've been the ones to go off and, and uh, you know, bring down the wool mammoth, but the females were gathering and that provided more of the regular food. And, and sometimes the females would go on those trips to get the woolly mammoth too. Mm -hmm. In any case, the, it was a much more egalitarian society. I've heard it called uh, by my colleague, um, Dr. Chris Ryan, who wrote Sex at Dawn, fierce egalitarianism. And uh, it was fierce because you know, even if you were the head hunter and you were the main one that that brought down that woolly mammoth, if you took more than your share of the food, you were in trouble. You weren't supposed to do that. There weren't billionaires in Bonoboville or among humans in those days. Uh, you had to, you know, be humble and and give up some of your booty, so to speak. And, uh, and, and yes, the females, of course, because they would get some of the food, uh, they would get the kind of sex that they wanted. And they weren't sex slaves. They became sex slaves with farming. When animals became slaves, when our beloved ox, happier the ox, but the ox became a slave, um, many animals became slaves and many humans became slaves under farming. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's something we're still trying to handle. Oh, yeah. And, and the, the negative effects of the agricultural revolution is a topic that we've returned to over and over again in this, in this podcast with different guests. And so it's, it's interesting that you're bringing it up again now from this other point of view. And it seems like one could 
not not to be reductionist, but one could just could 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 describe uh, bonobo culture as being sex positive. I think you can definitely describe it as sex positive. I you know. I think you can also, and maybe this is reductionist, I actually don't think to say they're sex positive is, I think they are. But I think they're kind of like humans used to be uh, in the hunter-gatherer days. Um, You know, maybe a few, before we became completely human, whatever that is, uh, or Neanderthal or, (laughs) you know, I think we were hunter-gatherers, we were more egalitarian, Uh, We were having a lot of sex. We weren't really getting married. Uh, We were probably just having different kinds of sex. Uh, I don't think there was this. um, Basically, along with farming, there became an understanding of where babies come from. If you learn how to, you know, farm, you learn how, you know, the the egg and the sperm go together. And... uh, And then once you learn how babies come about biologically, men can get very possessive. It's like, okay, then that's my baby. Now, bonobo males, they all are uncles, I guess. They don't know whose whose baby is whose. They know who the mom is, but they don't know who the dad is. And I know that's heresy in our society because we're all about dad's rights we're all about dads being responsible. And, and I, again, I see that that's a good thing in our society, the way that it is and the way that we don't support single mothers, especially. We need to have dads involved. But sometimes I look at Bonoboville and I go, hmm, it's maybe not so bad to have all the guys just kind of take care of all the kids and they don't know whose is whose. So they just give them all love. And they don't get so like greedy and possessive about this is my kid and this is my wife and nobody else can have her or him or, you know, and that possessiveness is is considered normal. And I, I as a sex therapist, uh, again, I talk to so many guys that say, why is it I'm excited by seeing my wife with another guy, even if only in my fantasy? What? Is there something wrong with me? I I should be more jealous. I should be more possessive. I say, well, you know, I I don't think jealousy is really a great thing. Maybe you shouldn't be more jealous and possessive. I mean, there are other considerations, such as maybe you don't want your wife to have sex with everybody just because of disease or things like that. Or maybe she doesn't want to have sex with everybody. But the fact that you're imagining it and that you're turned on by it and that you are not jealous of it, that's not bad. That's normal. Yeah. I think that one thing I've gotten from your work over the years that I've been following it is that basically, as long as the situation is consensual, basically anything goes. Well, I don't know. I, there, I, might, have a few, I might have a few boundaries more than just consent. Um, I mean, I was discussing cannibalism uh, on my own show the other day because <laughs> of uh, certain celebrities. And uh, yeah, I mean, there there have been cases in which people have agreed to have themselves uh, eaten. I, I don't, I, I still think that that's a crime. And right. uh, so I, I guess it, yeah, consent is certainly required and uh, essential and the bedrock of good sex but every once in a while, we run across uh, things uh, in which uh, consent is not the only thing that's required. Sometimes there are other factors, like if your fetish is for cannibalism. Right, right. Yeah, I guess that. I guess I wasn't really thinking about it that far. <laughs> yeah, I think about these things because you know what? As a sex therapist, I get pushed all the time. Right. Into, right. Well, if you think that anything goes in terms of consent, then how about this? So I got to rethink that. I mean, one thing I always feel in our uh, complex human society is that sex is complex. And that's why I hate censorship is because it's so... Uh, kind of across the board, you know, and 
uh, it just censors on the basis of a word and the word could have many different meanings. It censors on the basis of an image and the image could have many different meanings. Right, right. Speaking of, of images, I know that you are positive about porn as well. And that there's a split on the left about that topic as well. Yeah. And again, I would say there's complexities. I mean, I'm not positive mm-hmm. about all porn. Right. Uh, you know, certainly there was this uh, article that Nicholas Kristof did on some revenge porn. I am not for revenge porn. OK, that's no good. But I don't think the whole porn industry should suffer because a few douchebags make revenge porn. Revenge porn should be illegal. There should be certain types of porn because it involves non-consent. The person that's in that porn did not consent. Right. So, uh, so yeah, there, there are certain types of porn that I am against. Um, uh, certainly anything uh, with people underage. Uh, but I do think that uh, our society tends to uh, denigrate all forms of porn, uh, denigrate people that are involved in porn. I think that's very sad. Um, you know, like I said, I'm not against cancel culture. If a bunch of people want to get out there on Twitter or Facebook and say that somebody's, uh, you know, rotten because they have an OnlyFans page, go right ahead. You know, what I am against is censorship. Like, say that person um, has a YouTube channel and they also have an OnlyFans page. Well, if YouTube censors them, I'm against that. I'm not against people writing nasty comments, you know. I mean, that's the society we live in. Uh, But I am against big tech censoring from, I guess it's punching down. I'm for punching up, not punching down. And I see cancel culture as an effort often flawed, and I often very often disagree with cancel culture but it's it's people just it's the mob and i respect the mob i do not respect big tech yeah they've become really problematic and as someone who remembers the very earliest days of the internet and the late 80s early 90s when it was all just text and bulletin boards and stuff like that i mean it's really Uh, There was a promise at one point of it being legitimately democratic, legitimately, you know, free and open. And, you know, that was starting to collapse. Well, that's starting to change by the early 2000s. And and that's really just collapsed in the last 10 years to where it's become just kind of a big corporate controlled panopticon almost at this point, you know? I agree. It's worse than television used to be. <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned that because I feel like, you know, and, and we should wrap this up pretty soon because we've been, been talking for a while, but, you know, television was recognized by a lot of intellectuals and a lot of activists as being a negative impact on society. You know, like like beginning in like the early 70s, you might have, you might know that book, uh, Four Arguments for the Elimination of Television, you know? Mm. And uh, you know, by the end of the 90s, I remember that, you know, people would would brag that they didn't have a television. It was a way of kind of showing that, you know, I, I'm trying to have a life that's less fake or whatever. You know what I mean? And then the internet yeah. came along and everyone got sucked back into the screens. And now we're all on screens more than we ever were before. And I'm like, okay, wait a minute. There was a bait and switch that had been there or something. And I spent almost no time at all on screens in the 90s. And now screens are my life every day. And I can tell that they're not having an entirely positive effect. Yeah. And uh, some of that is thanks to the Corona apocalypse. So right. What can we do? I, I, I agree. I was yeah. trying to wean myself of screens and now I'm screenier than ever. <laughs> right. right. And, uh, and yes, bonobos, uh, just like humans, are very susceptible to COVID. So I'm happy that the bonobos at the zoo just got their shots. They got vaccinated. Oh, I didn't know uh, that. And I have mixed feelings about zoos. You know, I think mm-hmm. it's terrible to keep um, any kind of animals in jail which is what zoos are but at the same time you know zoos enable humans to see 
non-human animals where they can't in other circumstances, not everyone can travel to Africa and see bonobos. Uh, and it, it allows us to see bonobos. Also, uh, zoos like the San Diego Zoo are, uh, you know, helping to keep uh, the bonobos alive, helping to keep this highly endangered species from extinction. It's a sad situation because obviously the animals would be happier in their environment, but if their environment no longer exists or has been degraded, then what are we supposed to do? I get that one. It's really a, it's, it's a sad situation to be in for sure. It is, but since we're talking about their original environment habitat, I do want to give a shout out to three organizations that oh, are please. doing a lot to save the bonobos from extinction in the wild. Number one would be Lola Ya Bonobo, which means bonobo paradise. And it's a sanctuary for bonobo orphans that is right outside Kinshasa in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And it's run by uh, Claudine Andre and, uh, and Vanessa Woods, who wrote the Bonobo Handshake, and her husband, Dr. Um, Brian Hare, uh, our uh, work with Loli Yabonobo, and they save uh, these orphan babies because very often when the mothers are killed uh, by bushmeat hunters in the wild, the babies are left. Sometimes the hunters try to sell them, uh, but people aren't supposed to buy them. That's illegal. And, and very often they can't sell them. So Somehow or another, they get these orphans and they nurse them back to life. They're very traumatized physically and emotionally. Often they've seen their mother being killed. And at Lola, they're, they're nursed by uh, human mothers who help them. I mean, they don't literally nurse them. I got to say that. <laughs> uh, they, they just love them and, and take care of them. And uh, and. And they're amongst other bonobos, and it's a beautiful thing. And so Loli Ya Bonobo is uh, definitely helping to save the bonobos from extinction. And you might have seen that place in different uh, footage you've seen of bonobos, uh, including the Anderson Cooper visit to Lole. And, uh, and the Bonobo Conservation Initiative is run by another friend of mine, Sally Cox, who uh, who has a bonobo peace forest right in the center of um, the rainforest where uh, there are people that they pay and that work with um, with the bonobo conservation initiative to uh, to help protect the bonobos from the bushmeat hunters because usually the bushmeat hunters kind of come from out of town because the people in the villages around the rainforest and in the Congo rainforest, there are a lot of little villages. There are people living with the animals, the other non-human animals, I should say. Um, it's a very integrated lifestyle there. And so those people would not kill bonobos. They uh, call the bonobos their, their brothers or their cousins. Uh, but people from out of town, they don't know what that the bonobos are anything special. They just see a big piece of meat hanging from a tree and they shoot it. And so the Bonobo Conservation Initiative works with people, helps the helps those humans around that area to develop a consciousness and uh, to protect their bonobos in their area. And then the Bonobo Project is another organization that works with both the uh, Bonobo Conservation Initiative and uh, Lola Ya Bonobo, um, and they kind of spread the word about um, about how great the bonobos are. Of course, nobody talks about bonobo sex like I do. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. but all mm -hmm. these other organizations, they're trying to, you know, they're great, and I support them uh, 300 percent. But, you know, I'm a little kinky. And so I'm the one that talks about how kinky the bonobos are. They are the kinkiest apes on earth. 
That's great. That's great. I'll put links to all of those in, in the show notes. Okay. And, um, and just to kind of to, to, to wrap up the show, uh, first of all, I really encourage people to get your book, The Bonobo Way. It's awesome. Everything we talked about today is in there, except in more detail and a bunch of other subjects. And it's just a great, it's a great book. And where else would you send to people to find out about you and what you do and, and your work? Well, they can certainly come to my website, drsusanblock.com. They can go to my YouTube channel where there's a lot of uh, videos about bonobos. They can visit my bonobo uh, foundation, which is blockbonobofoundation.org. And that is um, just where I said, (laughs) blockbonobofoundation.org. And you know what? If you want to learn to release your inner bonobo, Uh, If you need to have a private conversation about your sexuality, uh, then you can call the Dr. Susan Block Institute, talk to me or one of my other therapists without borders. And the phone number is 213-291-9497. That's great. And that's, um, there's a charge or? Well, there is a charge for that. Mm -hmm. Hey, Speaking of which, though, I do have my own show, which is I'm always doing different shows. I've done the Dr. Susan Block show and I will continue to do that. But lately I've been doing a show with my husband, Captain Max, and uh, it's called FDR. Um, Am I allowed to use four letter words? Yes, you are. Mm -hmm. I've tried not to, but it stands for besides Franklin Delano Roosevelt, one of my favorite presidents. He wasn't perfect, but he did some mm-hmm. good things. Anyway, it also stands for fuck the rich. That's right. <laughs> uh, because, you know, I mean, I, it's a, basically the same idea of eat the rich, except we figure it's better to be fucked than eaten. It's more in line with the bonobo way. And um, we're not cannibals. Uh, Not really, anyway. Um, And so, yeah, we want to fuck the rich. We want you to give up some of your money and uh, and spread it around so we can all live the bonobo way uh, happily in in a world of abundance because we do have enough. And so that's what that show is uh, based on. Fuck the rich, FDR. It's on every Saturday Night Live. And you can call the show. That's a different telephone number. It's actually toll free. It's 1-866-289-7068. And we will talk to you for free. Of course, it's not like therapy therapy. So it's not like when you call and we talk to you privately and we, um, you know, treat you in a private way and uh, respect your anonymity uh, on our show, you know, you're out there. Of course, if you can disguise your voice, nobody will know it's you, but, uh, <laughs> but you're still on a show. So you're part of the entertainment. <laughs> and uh, so you have to put yourself uh, through that. But yeah, that's free, completely free to call on Saturday nights. And we will help you release your inner bonobo in front of everybody. Nice. Nice. Well, thank you so much for talking to me today, Dr. Block. I really appreciate it. I, I, I'm so inspired by uh, the Bonobos and I'm so inspired by the Bonobos because you've done such a great job of, of putting it out there, bringing them to our attention. And I really appreciate your work and just thank you so much. Well, I want to say that I really appreciate your work, Calibri. I've read several of your articles on Counterpunch where I write too occasionally and uh, really great stuff. You've been doing just such wonderful work for, uh, for our environment and for humanity. And I'm very, very happy to be a part of your show here. Well, you got me blushing now, Thank although you. no one can see it. <laughs> well, and to that, I say amen and a women. Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. 
To become a financial supporter of this podcast and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit radiofreesunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace. Go Bonobos.